Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we are going to use a tool to study population composition called a population pyramid. Here's the definition. A population pyramid is a bar graph representing the distribution of population by age and sex. A population pyramid is a snapshot of a population's age and sex structure. So here's how they work. Men are on the left, women are on the right, young are at the bottom, old are at the top, separated into five-year age intervals called cohorts. The width of each bar can be based on total population number, as you see here, or percentage. And it's worth noting, before we go too far, the population pyramids at the country scale can disguise significant local variations, such as urban versus rural, as well as a number of other factors. So, as usual, let's be critical. Let's be questioning. Let's ask, what would happen if I zoomed in to a specific part of this country? How would the population pyramid change? All right. Let's begin with some rules for how to evaluate these population snapshots. My two rules when examining a population pyramid are to look at the youngest age cohort from zero to five and to look at the largest age cohort. My little mnemonic device to remember this, you need to look at the bottom and the biggest. So let's look at an example and why I have these two requirements. Here is a population pyramid for Brazil. We look at the bottom. This cohort reflects the fertility rate. Is crude birth rate or total fertility rate a good indicator of development? Well, yes, they are. So the bottom cohort tells us about a country's level of development. Brazil has a declining birth rate, representative of stage three in the demographic transition. And the biggest cohort tells us about important factors within a country, like high birth rates, migration, war, among many other factors. In Brazil, the biggest cohort is in the working ages. This means that there are lots of workers, which could mean that the country is about to undergo rapid improvements in economic development. Population pyramids are incredibly useful because they can reveal a country's rates of birth, death, and migration. Countries that are growing rapidly will have a broad base. Their bottom is the biggest. A country like Afghanistan may face challenges providing for the education of this large population and the creation of jobs could be a problem in the near future. A country that is growing slowly or approaching zero population growth as the United States is may struggle with the number of elderly people who need assistance with retirement and health care. A country that is in population decline, where the bottom is very narrow and the biggest cohorts are near the top, like here in Japan, may experience labor shortages and declining demand for consumer goods and services and potentially economic decline. Population pyramids can be used to examine the unique opportunities or challenges that countries may face. They can reflect the areas that governments and their policies may need to address. For example, Russia's population pyramid still shows the legacy of World War II, with significantly fewer men than women, particularly in the oldest cohorts. Famine and disease are also represented on population pyramids. The Pyramid of Botswana reflects the impact of the AIDS epidemic. These pyramids have been referred to as population chimneys. 
due to the high death rate and relative lack of older adults. Fortunately, medical advances and education programs have slowed the spread of HIV and AIDS, and the population pyramid of Botswana did not become the population chimney that was forecasted. So now let's examine some important topics that we can examine using population pyramids. A sex ratio is the number of males per 100 females in the population. In general, slightly more males than females are born but women tend to live about five years longer than men. So the global sex ratio is about 101 males for every 100 females. Sex ratios are impacted by many different circumstances that present themselves around the world. Some countries have a higher rate of mothers who die during childbirth and other places lose or gain many working age men as they migrate for job opportunities. You can see that here in the United Arab Emirates, along with other countries like Qatar, Oman, and Saudi Arabia, where there is a huge number of working age males, which skews the sex ratio. In contrast, if an area is engulfed in war, they may lose many young males, Russia, as we mentioned earlier, lost lots of men during World War II, which has contributed to their country having the lowest overall sex ratio in the world, at about 86 males per 100 females in 2018. And when we examine the 65 and older population, it falls to a sex ratio of 46 to 100. Or there may be a cultural preference for male sons, as we see in India and China. In children under the age of 14, the sex ratio in India is 113 boys to 100 girls. And in China, it's 128 boys to 100 girls. There are several cultural and historical reasons for this skewed sex ratio. In both countries, traditionally, the son was expected to take care of his parents once they were too old to work. Combine this with the one-child policy that China had until 2015, families wanted to have a male child to ensure there was someone to take care of them as they got older. As a result, many female babies were abandoned or went unreported, and there has been a massive number of single men who now are unable to find a partner. In fact, in China, there are 30 to 40 million more young men than women. Many young men are unable to meet their traditional social and economic roles. Many of the unmarried men are those in the lower classes who become marginalized. As a result, crime rates have gone up with two thirds of violent and property related crimes in China being committed by young, unmarried men. There's been an increase in human and sex trafficking and the use of force or manipulation. The skewed sex ratio in India has led to many women from neighboring Nepal and Myanmar being trafficked into the country. Our final discussion point for tonight examines what are known as dependency ratios. These are the number of people under the age of 15 and over age 64 compared to the number of people active in the labor force. Basically, the dependency ratio is the number of people who need to be taken care of compared to the number of people to care for them. And while that definition is imperfect, because there are certainly people who are working younger than age 15 and well beyond age 64, along with the people in between who don't work, it does a good job of describing the relationship between workers and non-workers. The most important point is that the higher the dependency ratio, the heavier the burden to support dependence. As we mentioned earlier, population pyramids can indicate the patterns of age. So dependency ratios can be examined using 
these pyramids. In addition, it can help us understand the type of burden the dependents may place on the workers. Japan and Namibia, for example, have similar dependency ratios, but many of Japan's dependents are very old, while Namibia's are very young. So these countries may need very different services. So let's look at our map of population under the age of 15. For example, in Niger, 49.3% of the population is younger than 15. That's a very high youth dependency ratio. As a result, lots of public money may need to go towards educating their youth and growing their economy so that there are enough jobs for their future workers. Many other African countries, as well as Afghanistan, also have high youth dependency ratios. While in Germany, 21% of its population is over 65 years old, so they have a high elderly dependency ratio. And they may need more retirement homes and public money devoted to health care and social safety nets. Many European countries, along with Canada, Japan, and South Korea, among others, have high elderly dependency ratios. But Japan presents an example of why this is imperfect. Many elderly people in Japan are still working, so the dependency ratio may overestimate the actual social burden placed on the working age population. But we're going to continue to examine all this information that can be extracted from population pyramids when we come back to class. Have a good evening, everyone.